Welcome everyone to 117. <clears throat> and today we have a very, very special guest joining us, Patrick Reagan. But before I introduce him, let me reintroduce myself. Um, you may or may not uh, remember me. I've been uh, privileged to be here at 117 with um, Tim many times and with Matt. I work with Tim. I'm the current director of public engagement at All We Can. Um, and by way of introducing today, uh, let me, uh, I'm going to let Patrick speak for himself. You may well know of Patrick, of the work he's done and is doing with churches. Um, but let me just take us back to All We Can's strapline, which I know from conversations with some of you uh, has real meaning for, for you. Every person's potential fulfilled. That's what uh, we as a movement, including most of you, uh, agree with, stand with and pray for. And as we speak to Patrick, I think it's a fantastic way to enter into that conversation. The idea that everyone has potential, but not everyone's potential has been fulfilled. Um, and Patrick is giving his life to enabling the potential that God has put in people to be realized and unlocked. So we're going to bring Patrick in now. Uh, let's hold our breath. Um, I'm hoping <laughs> it works. But welcome, Patrick. Great to have you with us on 117. Great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. No, it's our honour, Patrick. Um, so what I wanted to be uh, to start with doing, in fact, let me just echo the welcome of Diane there. Um, good to join you from Scarborough. You, you, you may have watched 117 before, been involved, Patrick, and seen that we have friends join us from uh, across the UK and further afield as well. Um, but maybe I could start with a question about an art form. And the art form you know very well, far better than I do, is called Kintsugi. And I'd love you to just introduce us to that kind of ancient art form, what it is, and then how does it relate to what you're doing? Yeah, sure. I mean, the word Kintsugi means Japanese, it means um, golden joinery. It's the Japanese name for golden joinery. And so the whole concept is if you get a bowl and you break it, I guess we would mend it with super glue or we'd probably, if we want to chuck it away. And uh, But if we do mend it with super glue, we try and hide the cracks. We try and pretend it's not broken. And uh, what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. So arguably the object becomes more beautiful for being broken. It certainly becomes more unique. There isn't a bowl like that on planet earth and i'm a firm believer that beauty comes from brokenness that our scars are not to be ashamed of our scars make us who we are i mean jesus in his resurrected body had scars so there's going to be scars in heaven and uh, and really that was the motivation uh, for us to start this charity called kintsugi hope after a time of real brokenness in my own life uh, around the areas of emotional and mental health and, uh, and 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 really trying to struggle how do i get through this and that was a really beautiful metaphor for me Brilliant. Thanks, Patrick. Um, the next question that comes to my mind um, from from that beautiful description you just gave about making a feature of the cracks, uh, accepting brokenness can be beautiful. Tell us a little bit about your own journey. It sounds like you were in a place where the cracks and the brokenness maybe wasn't beautiful. What was the journey and what was involved in you getting to a point of saying, do you know what? There might be a way of understanding this brokenness as something beautiful and god-given even yeah i think i went through one of those stages in my life i always call it the tetris moment i don't know if you remember the game tetris the computer game yeah um, it's when all these blocks fall out of the sky and you're desperately trying to get them in a straight line and um and uh, rotating these shapes and stuff and then they just get quicker and quicker and quicker and then they go so quick you're like oh my goodness game over i just can't do this anymore and I think sometimes life can feel a little bit overwhelming, you know, and there isn't just often one thing that happens. It's often a combination of things going on at the same time. And, and for me, it was around um, my dad getting cancer, uh, getting seriously ill. My my kids, uh, my daughter, Kezia, got a condition called HSP. I had to have major limb reconstruction surgery on both my legs. Um, we, uh, uh, Diane had a miscarriage, we lost a baby, and it was all like, oh my goodness, I'm just spiraling out of control. And I started to really struggle with anxiety. And, and I started thinking about all the sermons that I'd heard over the years on mental health and anxiety. And, and that took me about 2.5 seconds because there weren't many. And when they were, anxiety was talked about, it was always like, well, you just need to trust God a bit more. Or you just need to pray a bit more, you know, as if I'd never thought of that idea. 
And, and I just got into that place where, you know, I just was craving for something real and honest and authentic and to have a really honest conversation. And I remember actually, um, we had a visit from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. I hope you caught those names as they dropped there. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, these photos of me and the Duke and Duchess, they literally went around the world. I mean, they were in OK Magazine and Hello Magazine and the news, and, you know, literally everywhere. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, the show reel looks fantastic. The Facebook page is going crazy. Um, but the behind the scenes is something completely different. And I think sometimes maybe we're all a little bit guilty of always communicating the show reel and, uh, and not communicating the behind the scenes. And, uh, and so I guess I went on a journey that I wanted to be real. I wanted to be authentic. I wanted to understand how, how does it work? Um, faith with tragedy and mental health and, and, and what can we do also to support others? So people don't feel ashamed and alone if they're struggling. And, uh, I think that's so important. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thanks, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> tell me, um, as Christians, as people of faith, do you think, and, and I guess I'm asking, would you be willing to give us a real answer um, in the spirit that 117 is meant to be about honesty and openness? As people of faith and Christians, do you think we either do uh, do a leading light job, a brilliant job, or we do an awful job, or we're somewhere in the middle, compared perhaps sometimes to uh, good people who may not have a faith to support them. I guess what I'm asking is, in that period of your own brokenness, did you find the church was able to meet you in the place? And the question isn't in the spirit of judgment on the church at all. I'm part of the church. It's in the spirit yeah. of, I know you stand for, of in order to move forward, we've got to be realistic and honest about where we are now. Um, so perhaps you can yeah. tell me a little bit about your experience in that time with church and people of faith. Yeah, I, I found it hard, to be honest. I, I, felt, I felt incredibly lonely and, uh, um, and just, just I think sometimes it's, you know, we have to be really careful not taking Bible verses out of context and uh, throwing them around when someone's going through a really tough time. And, and I think that when someone's going through a really tough time is often our tendency is to try and go and fix them and and for all my experiences that people don't want to be fixed they want to be loved and cared for and walk alongside and uh, and so you know i think we have to be really careful in our language uh, you know even you know some of our worship songs you know the psalms for instance 40 percent of the psalms are laments they're david crying out to god saying i just don't get it i, I trust you but i don't get it and and yet a lot of our language and a lot of our worship is, is actually the opposite and, and don't get me wrong we need some of those faith-filled songs but I guess that we also need to be real and we need to be honest and and I think we really need to help people and support people and not try and fix them and uh, or give them platitudes you know uh, people used to say to me well God will not give you more than you can handle which is actually misquoting the verse in Corinthians that's talking about temptation or everything happens for a reason or they quote Romans you know um, God works everything together for our good and I remember my pastor saying to me, if we're going to quote that verse in church, you need to write it on the back of a very large check before you mention it to anyone. And, uh, you know, because it is, it is true. We, we need to be much more caring, sensitive and, and understanding at this time yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, how ripe or raw or relevant, uh, those weren't intentionally all words beginning with R. Um, but <laughs> how, Good how, sermon. Yeah, no, thanks. Three points. They, <laughs> yeah. they should really all start with J as well, shouldn't they? Um, yeah, they should. <laughs> how, how relevant in your experience in the years uh, since you started Consigi Hope, how relevant has this been? In other words, putting it really bluntly, have you found that being open, certainly in the church and beyond, about emotional, uh, mental health, uh, spiritual mental health, physical mental, you know, the, 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 the mental health, how needed is this? Yeah, it, it's been incredible, really. I feel like honesty breeds more honesty. And and I think once someone starts to open up, then actually it allows, it gives people permission to also open up. And uh, so one of the things we did is um, we, we wrote a 12 week wellbeing program um, that looks at all key issues that often aren't talked about perfectionism, resilience, um, stigma. Uh, 
uh, anxiety, you know, all this shame, all these different things. We wrote it in learning styles. And basically what we wanted to do is train the churches up to run this in their community. And, uh, and for two reasons, really, we wanted to help people with who are struggling with social isolation, but also promote positive mental health. So a bit like you would go to a gym to invest in your physical health. Why don't you do something to invest in your mental health? Because we all have mental health in exactly the same way as we have physical health. What often happens is we get confused between mental illness and mental health, which are very, very different things, as in physical illness and physical health. Yeah. And uh, and so we did this. Um, we wrote this program, and before COVID, it was being picked up by forty churches across the UK, and it was brilliant. They were running it in um, homeless hostels. They were running it in home groups. They were running it in pubs and coffee shops and schools and universities. And then COVID hit. And I was like, I think we're doomed. Um, we're going to have no money. You know, um, yeah. we moved all the trade. It's been incredible because there was a mental health crisis before COVID. But actually what COVID's done is escalated it. So we are now working with over 300 churches. We've got over a thousand leaders um, running groups literally all over the UK. And the stories that come back, the friendships that are formed, the transformed lives that happen. And it is, is about people coming, you know, and I would say there's a big difference between belonging and fitting in. And if we're going to say to people, we want you to be all you can. And uh, then it is, it's about that. You've got to go alongside people and uh, and you've got to get alongside them and be non-judgmental and uh, and pray and, and be there as well at the same time so we're thrilled at, to see these groups growing mm. all over the place Brilliant. and where would any of our our community here who are watching where would they go give us a, a url or another way for them to find out more about about the the church of mental health or mental health friendly church guidance and course yeah, so um, so if they want to find out about the Kintsugi Wellbeing Groups and how to train, just go to our website and uh, it, it all the information's up there, and uh, and you'll be able to um, you know find out when the training is. We also do these info sessions where people just sign up for an hour, so they can ask all the questions they want. Um, we are finding we were getting so many phone calls to the office. We thought let's just do it all together, and uh, and so it's lovely, you know, and. Uh, it, it, it's a really amazing opportunity to reach into our community. I sort of feel like over the years, the church, we've done some amazing things in poverty and crime prevention and uh, education. But this sort of area of mental health has sort of evaded us, really. And yeah. uh, but, you know, there is a church in every community across this country. Yeah. And and in every community there are at the moment people who are struggling. Um, we've been working with social prescribing, you know, where doctors and social prescribers can socially prescribed to Kintsugi group, which is an amazing opportunity. We had one area where it was like, the need is so big in this area. We have 500 people we could socially prescribe to your groups. So I was like, we haven't got capacity uh, for 500 people. We need more churches to sign up yeah. and just yeah. get alongside their communities. So really, if I can interpret you, it's an invite to everybody here who's part of a church to say, look, there is need in your community. We'd love you yeah. to, to come and join us in this. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, now, I'm going to ask Patrick another question. But while I do, if there's anyone uh, who's part of the community who wants to put a question in um, as an encouragement there from um, Dee, Dee saying what an outstanding program of care and support. And um, I, I know everyone watching would agree entirely with that, Patrick. Um, but if anyone wants to post a question just while I ask Patrick the next one, please do. And we will hopefully be able to put them to Patrick in a minute. Um, and, and obviously on subject, we're not sort of interested in Patrick what did you do for your holiday last summer although I'm sure that <laughs> um so Patrick um let me ask you a question um about uh the the book which I think we're seeing behind us bouncing forward or behind you even um tell us about bouncing forward uh it's your new book but tell us what drove you to write it and what's the core call or ambition or message of it Sure. Well, um, this is my sixth book and uh, my previous book was called Honesty Over Silence and it had this tagline, um, it's okay not to be okay, which I do firmly believe in. But after I wrote that, I had so many emails of people just telling me their stories uh, and and they were both heartbreaking and heartwarming. And, and I started to think, I do believe it's okay not to be okay, but I don't want people to get stuck not being okay. I want people to thrive. 
And so I started thinking about this whole thing of resilience because resilience, by definition, is thriving in the midst of adversity. It doesn't mean that adversity suddenly disappears. It means within it, we actually learn to thrive. Um, so it was January last year, I said to my publisher, I think I'm writing a book on resilience, um, thriving in the midst of adversity. And then, of course, March, COVID hit. Um, and then we had that, the unjust murder of George Floyd. And I was like, how on earth do I write a book about thriving in the midst of adversity with this as a backdrop? And as I started to research, it was fascinating because everyone described resilience often as bouncing back. I mean, you will hear it on the news practically every day. Will the economy bounce back? Will the church bounce back? Will education bounce back? Will the NHS bounce back? And I was reflecting, you know, I'm not sure I want to bounce back. That's not because I'm glad we've been through what we've been through. It means that I've learned stuff through the tough times. Why well, do I want to go back to my pre-trauma self? And I've learned things for good and for bad, you know, and, and I found a different definition of resilience that said resilience is less about bouncing back and learning to bounce forwards. It's what have those experiences taught us? So our values have been changed as a society and as individuals. You know, I often reflect yeah. that our low skill workers within a week became our key workers. Yeah. And we started to honour people in different roles. Um, we started to be much more concerned about health and family. And, and we started asking ourselves questions like, what does success really mean? Um, what is the most important thing to me at the moment? It, it's relationship. And so I think those conversations is like they're the bigger questions to ask in life, right? Um, what are our values? What are our priorities? What does it mean to bounce forwards? And uh, so it's all about resilience, courage and change. And uh, those themes interweave in throughout all the chapters. So Brilliant. it was a huge challenge to write, but really yeah, good fun that. as well. No, it sounds <laughs> excellent. And where, what, who, who publishes it? What's the easiest way that, that any of our community here could, could get a copy? Yeah, I mean, again, just go to our website. Um, everything's on there, um, www.kitsugihope.com. It'll be in the chat. Right. Yep. Um, get hold of it there. And maybe get hold of it for someone that's struggling. You know, if you know someone that's going through a tough time, sometimes it's yeah. nice just to get a gift, isn't it, where someone's yeah. thinking of you. Well, and, and just taking what you said there, you know, it, it may be that in some churches um, uh, there is that we know that this issue is is not exempt from anyone. There may be people in churches who are putting on a brave face, but not necessarily able at the moment to open up. And I'd encourage people buy, as Patrick says, buy a copy or buy two copies uh, and just maybe even go to church with it in your bag and just, you know, say to God, is there someone here I should offer it to? Um, because I think that's often the challenge, isn't it? It's the first step um, in relationships. Now, obviously, you need to be sensitive and appropriate with that. But as Patrick says, get an extra copy and offer it to someone. Um, if I can jump to the questions, I've had a question in here by uh, by WhatsApp from somebody who I know who's in the community. They asked, what's one thing you'd recommend we can all individually do for our mental health? Yeah, that's a really interesting one, because um, when people ask me that, normally the answer to every question seems to be exercise, right? Uh, when it comes to <laughs> mental health, it's like, well, and, and I think exercise is important, all that sort of stuff. But what I think the bigger issue is, is that I think that we are our own biggest critics. And so a lot of us live by what I call the shoulds, the must, the oughts. I should be okay. I ought to be stronger. I must pull myself together. And our inner critic will take us to places where no one else would go. It will tell us we're a bad parent, we're, we're overweight, we're not very good at this, we're not very good at that. And, and that's where shame's attached to, really. And I think shame and guilt are two different things. You know, guilt is I've done something wrong. Shame is I actually believe I am wrong. And that sense of worth. You know, Brené Brown famously says that shame has two gremlins. Who do you think you are and you're not enough? And actually, one of the keys to having good mental health is showing yourself some self-compassion. When I said that, when my uh, counselor said that to me, I was like, I'm a bloke. I don't do self-compassion. You know, I don't do candles. I don't do bubble baths. <laughs> and she sort of looked at me like, you've totally misunderstood what this is. Because self-compassion takes discipline. Self-compassion is talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. Because you wouldn't dream of talking to your best friend the way that you talk to yourself sometimes. Um, if someone's struggling, you would 
you know, talk to them with gentleness and kindness, um, understanding. And self-compassion is being able to do that for yourself, to, you know, to let yourself off the hook. That doesn't mean, it doesn't mean about taking responsibility. Of course it does. Actually, self-compassion means I need to exercise. It means I need to get to the gym. It means I need to watch my diet and sleep well and all those sort of things. But I think it's a bigger picture than simply just saying exercise. <laughs> um, it's the whole way we think. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's really important. That's a really key yeah. thing for good mental health. No, that's helpful. Thank you. It reminded me of <clears throat> I worked at Tear Farm for many years and um, one of my fantastic bosses there was a gentleman called Andrew. And he used to um, whenever there was a kind of issue, particularly in, in our teams or the group between two people, as in any organization you get, he would sit people down and say, first question is, what is the story you're telling each other or, or rather you're telling yourself about the other person? And nine mm. times out of 10, just by verbalizing, you know, I, I think that the reason they've done that is this. And then yeah. they would explain the reason. And you'd think, well, there's actually no issue. Now, I'm not saying they're all that easy, but you, yeah. it's really powerful what, what um, that, that idea of what challenging ourselves, what's the story we're telling ourselves. And sometimes yeah. I've found verbalizing it even, you suddenly stand back and think, do you know what? There's the problem. Uh, and I appreciate in in the areas we're talking about it's often much deeper and needs much more work but but there's a really powerful principle in there um yeah somebody, somebody else has pinged a question which is what did you learn from the pandemic that you want to bounce forward to wow what a fantastic question yeah. that, yes. is. That, yeah. is, that is a really really good question and oh, there's so much that um i could say on that I'm trying to think of so I think one thing I learned was this whole area of gratitude is like how do you be grateful when life's really tough <laughs> and when I was writing the book I found this definition I've forgotten who it's from now but it was basically saying that gratitude is hunt the good stuff I really like that mm. it's like there's not a denial that bad stuff is there but actually gratitude is going to look for the good stuff and and I thought that was really really powerful um, there was also stuff around, I've already mentioned values. You know, I, I think values are priorities. And uh, so there's, a, again, there's a chapter in the book called What is Success? Great question to ask the church, great question to ask charities, because normally we associate set success with numbers or stuff. So, you know, I've got friends and they would go, yeah, my big values relationship. And they work every hour God sends them. They hardly see their kids and they know no one in their community. So I'm like, are you being successful? And um, and they're like, well, no, because I'm not attached to my values. Um, you know, the other thing I really, and I have to remember this the whole time, is I, I was brought up in a generation, you know, like history makers. We're going to go and change the world. We're going to do it all. Um, and, and then I just got exhausted trying. You know? <laughs> and I realized that actually I don't take God anywhere. He's already there and and it's more about joining in and, and seeing what he's doing and 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 actually accepting limitations is important it's a sign of maturity you know there are only 24 hours in a day um i'm limited in terms of my i'm not particularly academic uh i'm not great at admin i've got people around me who are brilliant at both of those things um i can't travel the world like i used to because i've got kids so actually accepting those limitations isn't a bad thing it's a sign of maturity and I think for some of us, we've been living too hard for too long and uh, been too strong for too long. And of course, the paradox of the Gospels is in our weakness, we are strong. And because uh, we connect to something in ourselves, which makes us truly human. And we, when we share in that, I think actually people find that quite a, a beautiful thing because then we connect at a different level. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot in there. I'm sure everyone kind of part of this uh, broadcast will be going away and through the afternoon reflecting back on certain key things you've said um <clears throat> i love you just to summarize in really simplistic terms make a feature of the cracks don't hide them uh don't equally i guess don't um don't pretend they're not there um but but honor them name them and work with them um and and patrick this has been really really inspiring i know for a lot of people uh judging by the comments and i know for for me as well so thank you um 
no problem. Uh, I don't. I haven't been on one seventeen enough through these kind of interviews to know. Do we normally finish by kind of inviting the speaker to kind of say a blessing or a prayer for us? Um, Patrick, if I was to ask you to do that, would you feel comfortable doing it? Don't yeah, no, of course. Absolutely. No, I'm very happy to if that's what you'd like me to do. That would be lovely <laughs> if, if you'd be happy to. Um, and then I, I can invite the community just to kind of um, just to just to stand, sit, do what you feel comfortable with at home and just, um, you know, open your hearts as Patrick uh, prays with us. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah. Well, what I thought I'd do is I'd read you a prayer, um, a special prayer that meant so much to me um it's by thomas merton who was uh, an american monk and uh, and it sort of is a bit like a lament but it, it is beautiful and he says this my lord god i have no idea where i'm going and i do not see the road ahead of me i cannot know for certain where it will end nor do i really know myself and the fact that i think i'm following your will does not mean that i'm actually doing so but I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me in the right road, that I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. And you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Father, I thank you that actually that is it, that you promise never to leave us nor forsake us, that actually you're not removed from our suffering, you're not removed from the tough questions, the unanswered prayers, that you're there in the midst, that you're there going through the anxiety, going through the trying to just see our kids do better to see life's change things shift and so god i pray that as we grapple with some big issues this afternoon that people listening to this would know that they're loved and they're accepted and that you see their potential and you see all that they can be in jesus name amen amen thank you so much patrick um i know everyone here like me will will feel um uh, encouraged and challenged appropriately by everything you've said so thank you um and just to remind everyone bouncing forward uh, as a, a way to take forward what patrick said and reflect further get yourself copy um and some lovely comments there that hopefully patrick you can see as well um so yeah thank you for joining us uh, tim will be back very soon so don't worry you won't have to tolerate me for too much longer uh, but it's been uh, lovely patrick and thank you for giving up your time and kind of every power to the elbow of Kintsugi Hope as you as you move forward. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. Thank you. Thank you.